Welcome to the show. My name is Karen Holton. I am an ET experiencer and ambassador, an ascension coach, a direct channel, a shamanic guide, and I'm the host of Aliens and Astrology. Be sure to check out more of my unique content on my website, www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com and my YouTube, Odyssey, and Telegram channels, Karen Holton TV. I can also be found on the Forbidden Knowledge News Network, www.forbiddenknowledge.news. My paranormal experiences have taught me to replace my beliefs with working theories, which evolve over time. My co-host is Dave Petrella, and although we hold two different viewpoints, we both see things from the same broad perspective, and we are both passionate about the ascension process. Hi, I'm Dave Petrella. I'm an astrologer, biologist, spiritual guide, and Oak Island theorist. You can find me on Facebook and YouTube at Dave Petrella, and on Instagram at Dave Petrella 12. Please feel free to send me an email through my YouTube page. I'm happy to join Karen in our search for truth. We can find the answers we're looking for about health, science, extraterrestrial intelligence, and many other related topics. We're glad to have you join us today for the show. Welcome back to Aliens and Astrology. We are so happy to have a guest with Dave and I today. His name is Wayne Murphy. And I'll just give you a little bit of his background before we get started. Wayne is a Mohican um, Nation tribal elder. He spent 29 years in law enforcement. He spent one and a half years with FPS Homeland Security. He spent three years with the state of Wisconsin um, investigating welfare fraud. He spent three years with the Wisconsin State Department of Corrections. He was a violent sexual offender supervisor. Wayne's also been a private investigator and he's the founder of Team Templar North America. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, Wayne, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, Karen and Dave. I thank you for reaching out in our past conversations. Oh, definitely. Welcome, Wayne. Okay, so uh, what we'd like to do today um, is I want to talk about kind of the ancient America topic. And so um, there's a lot of question about, you know, the prehistory of North America, maybe some of the things that happened here uh, that are controversial throughout history. You know, I know I'll just speak for myself. It's probably very similar for a lot of people listening today. Um, I was taught that Columbus, of course, you know, discovered uh, North America. And, um, you know, it turns out that that might not be completely true or actually not even mostly true. And so and actually, it's interesting, too, because um, and I, I've worked with several native tribes as well in North America. And, uh, you know, they have a little little bit different story. Uh, I've worked with uh, Jamaicans as well. And they have a few things to say about Columbus too um, that are not necessarily fitting the the narrative that we're taught in in school. I hope it's changing, but uh, I haven't been in school for a while, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> so in any case, in any case, um, we've got uh, I think you got, you got a, a few slides, Wayne, that we can go through, and if you'd like to tell people about uh, your discovery up in Wisconsin and uh, kind of how that informs the the ancient America topic. Sure. Okay. Great. Uh, I, I also forget. have a, a couple uh, a couple of questions, Wayne. I'm hoping that in your presentation you can go back to when the Knights Templar was established as a group, a recognized group, and um, approximately 
um, because I know very little about it. And so these are just questions that I had. When, when did the whole Knights Templar thing start? And then, um, and then of course, the, we're finding all kinds of evidence that um, different groups like the Templars may have indeed been in North America long before as, um, as uh, Dave just described. And, but I was wondering if you could just cover a little bit uh, of the history of the Templars for those of us that aren't really familiar with it. And I'll just uh, do a screen share. Um, and regarding the Knights Templar, I'm now expert on this subject. Um, I've been uh, doing this for about four years now, and there's various people who have different opinions on this subjects when they actually began some as early as the, the 11th century and some as uh, later on in the 12th century. There seems to be a period around the 1100s when uh, the Pope officially established, I believe it was 1119, when the Pope officially established the Knights Templar and the organization. Even though there's other uh, documentation out there that they pre-existed those dates and they were um, already on to the Crusades into the Holy Land. So um, I work with Sean Williamson. He's a master stonemason. He's an expert on stones and um, everything related to that type of subject. He understands how to cut stone, how stone was cut, what tools were possibly used during that time period. He has done numerous work for major museums in London in different parts of the world, taking a look at their copies of tombstones that are supposedly Templar related. And one time I know they put him to a test and out of I think six or seven tombstones, he was able to correctly judge six of the seven and tell him which ones were actual Templar carved and which ones were fake. So he is uh, our second, my second in command. He's the president of Team Templar North America. He has stayed at Roslyn Chapel for quite a while. So he's my resident expert in mentoring me along in everything Templar. So when he was working with Andrew Sinclair, um, I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, I know Dave has. Um, Andrew Sinclair did extensive, extensive work on the Knights Templar. I have one of his books and it's just an amazing read. And Sean was able to stay at Roslyn Chapel for I believe four to six months. And he was kind of like taking care of the place as he was working on it. And he was able to go through many and all documents that they had. And he was free to look at them and take what information that he needed. So then when Andrew passed away, he left Sean all of his work. So that work has never been published and Team Templar is sitting on that work. So one of the things that I did when I first came across this slide you're seeing was in the early, in the early 80s. I, I joined the Milwaukee Police Department in, two, in 1980 and I was hunting with my brother Robert and we were back in this area and there was probably about a foot of snow and I wanted to come to where this area was next to the river. And being so deep as snow, things never look the same as they do in the fall. So on an approach of this area, I could see the river where I wanted to be. And then all of a sudden I stopped and I looked and I said, man, this is about 30 feet down. And this was just out of place for me, having hunted the tribal lands for most of my life. This is something that just uh, I had never come across before. I made my way to the edge, looked around, and, and it just wasn't a natural rock formation. And again, you have to understand it's covered with a lot of snow. I made my way around. Um, it's quite a large formation. So I made my way around to one of the sides. And on the eastern side, um, there was an opening that was a probably about uh, two and a half to three feet wide, and it went about six or seven feet tall. And the significance is that 
in the Knights Templar, when they were building things, they always made an eastern entrance that pointed towards Jerusalem. So I'm thinking, you know, this is a this is this is just a natural cave, and that's the way it looks. And uh, we have mountain lions and wolves and bear. And geez, what a better place to hibernate! So we're carrying a high-powered rifle, and uh, I do the right thing. I threw a large stick inside and kind of waited. And uh, when nothing threw that stick back out, I kind of felt it was safe to go in. So Okay, it looks like Wayne. Uh, uh, I'm back again. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Can you repeat the last thing you said after you threw the stick in and it didn't come back out because we lost you at that point? Sure. Um, so I waited, uh, you know, about 20, 30 seconds. And then the, you know, being a policeman, I'm very curious. I, I want to know why. I want to know why it's, how come it's like this. And so I went inside. And once I got inside, I looked around and I said, hey, you know, this is this is not an ordinary structure. The the walls are 90 degrees, they're flat. And then as I got about four to five feet in, I noticed it made a hard right turn. And this was to the north. The walls, as you can see in the picture, are flat and they're square. You could probably uh, stick your arms out side to side. And it's probably six to seven feet deep. And if you'll notice on top, you'll see a round rock. Well, that rock is faced. And underneath that rock, it's also round and the back is faced, meaning that it's been stonework. Someone intentionally um, made a flat stone out of this rock and somehow placed it on top of here. How? I, I have no idea. At that time, I knew very little about the Knights Templar or even what this structure could be. So I climbed out the entrance, you can see there, and due to erosion and things like that, right? I don't know if you can see where my, um, I think my mouse is going to point to anything on the screen. But right down in front, you can see there's a large rock that's laying in the entrance. Well, that rock is probably four feet tall. So one could, you have to slide over that to get in into this so-called cave. And if it was uh, standing up, it would be a perfect square. And objects like this don't happen in nature, naturally. Um, I believe that this was, this rock was, was worked by, uh, by people. Fast forward, I kind of forgot about this. To, you know, I was involved heavily in police work um, most of my whole life and um, kind of put this on the back burner. And then um, one day I'm hunting in 2018. I had retired from the police force. I'm sitting in my ground blind and I see this another rock formation I thought was kind of interesting. And at the time it looked like... Uh, Looked like the shape of a frog, for lack of better descriptions. So I took a couple pictures of it and just kept it in my phone. And then I was sitting around with my brothers at a tribal elder Christmas party. And I said, hey, did you get those pictures of that strange rock I sent you? Yeah, he says, they're pretty neat. And, and we're looking at that. And then as I enlarged them, I, I looked, I couldn't believe it. I could see the outline of two fish. And that, that shouldn't be there also. So later on the spring of 2019, I went back there, or 2018, I went back to with my brothers and I was examining this rock and I found a cross pate carved into this rock. I, I knew it, I, I knew what it was, but I didn't know much about it. So I took quite a few pictures of it. And, um, uh, that's what started me on this journey and an amazing journey that it has become. Um, I, uh, I reached out, I was previously working uh, with Gretchen Cornwall. She answered 
one of my um, messages through Facebook. And um, she had assisted me for several years and trying to validate this. And eventually um, she moved on to uh, other uh, things in her career. But this rock prospect age just would not leave me. So after I found this uh, cross that day, I went back to the tomb with my brother. And I said, you know what? The tomb in itself is very interesting. The shape of it, the round rock, uh, things like that. I said, if we only find two or three more pieces of evidence, physical evidence, um, as an investigator, a criminal investigator, I've probably uh, been involved in over 500 homicides in my career. So I was trained very well to look at things. Uh, Sean Williamson and I laugh. We're oblique lateral investigators because we don't look at things the way, uh, say, an academic would. Um, sometimes we'll search whole documents just for small key phrases and then search them, and which led to numerous, numerous other finds. So I go back and into the tomb, start... Uh, um, looking around, and I learned through another investigator that if you use your camera, the lens on your, your phone, I have this type of phone camera, that because of the pixelation in the phone, it's much more detailed, it's more detailed than the human eye. So I started taking pictures, many, many photographs of inside the tomb, then I would go back at a later date and study these. Inside of that tomb, I found three crosses carved on the back wall of the tomb. Now this is really getting interesting. So then I heard about Sean Williamson uh, and the person that I talked to said they didn't have much luck talking with him. So I was able to message him on Facebook. I said, would you uh, take a look at this? And it's been over a year and a half now, and we become great friends. We talk regularly. He's in Scotland, and um, he is just really ecstatic about this find. I'll tell you a little bit more about the tomb as time went on. I learned more about the Knights Templar, about what they stood for, and the one thing that, as an investigator, that puzzled me the most: why is this in Wisconsin? of all places, why not on the East Coast, you know? There's evidence that the Norse were, you know, up in Nova Scotia. And there was also evidence in New York where they found a spear point. And there's also legends among my people, it's called the legend of corn hair, where when the Dutch were trying to Christianize them, uh, they just adamantly refused. And, and then they said, well, why? And, they said, and then through their interpreters, they said, because we're afraid of the people in the longboats that would come back and punish us. These are Vikings. So I still wasn't convinced that this was what it really was. I, I, I probably worked seven months trying to disprove it. And I was able to meet more um, People that were interested in the Templars in London and uh, the Netherlands, um, up in Canada, Nova Scotia, talking to these people. And they were very excited about what I found. So you start amassing this information. And then there was another legend amongst our people. There was a, uh, he was a missionary by the name of John Sargent. He was uh, interviewing trying to bring the gospel, they were called the Stockbridge people, which is an incorrect name. The Dutch give them the name Stockbridge. It was named after a town in Holland. They couldn't actually pronounce their names. A lot of the Indian names back then were uh, phonetically uh, spelt and phonetically stated. So they just shortened the names or adjusted the names as what they wanted, wanted them to be. Well, well during this um, interview with John Sargent, he says, you know, he's telling them about the Bible, and he says, you know what, we had that book years ago. He says, but our people lost the ability to read it, so we buried it with an Indian chief. 
Well, this in itself was kind of odd because there was a guy by the name of Joseph Merrick who happened to be friends with John Sargent. He tells Joseph Merrick and guess what? Joseph Merrick, he goes and starts digging around in these Indian graveyards and he finds a piece of leather. It was uh, described about six or eight inches long and it appeared to be sealed up with pine pitch and uh, something else. And so he said he threw it in a box and didn't pay much attention to it. Well, he said a few days later, he got curious about this letter and took his knife and started cutting it open. And inside he found four pieces of small paper and they looked very old and um, he couldn't read the writing on them. So there was some very scholared clergy that just happened to be in the town where he's at and they he took that to the clergy and they turned out to be original papyrus written in Hebrew, early Hebrew, probably Phoenician, and they were four verses out of the Old Testament. So you take the, the Viking spear point off in New York, the legend of corn here, the Mohican people having these four um, they were called phylacteries written on papyrus. And, and all of a sudden this evidence starts to build up. Still isn't enough for me. I didn't quit. So then I, I researched this find and found other places where he took it to a uh, college and they did an examination on it, wrote about it in, in quite detail, and then mysteriously lost isn't that special? Well, that led me to a few key phrases in their documents where there was a, a, a European living on the eastern shores of Lake Michigan in Wisconsin. He had been living with a Native American tribe for quite some time. It could have been probably the Menominee or the Fox. And they had a copper tube in their possession. It took him quite a while to convince them that to let him open it up to see what was inside. Well, they finally gave him permission. He opens it up inside. Inside, there's four pieces of papyrus, small fragments of letters. They described a couple of inches high, uh, inch wide, written in an original Hebrew language. Again, the same four verses out of the Old Testament. Evidence is starting to pile up. Now, what do I do? Um, start to, um, uh, I'm kind of scrambling now. Who can I go to? Who can I talk to? Um, things, word gets out a little bit. People start contact with, contact, uh, contacting me. Um, and I start doing interviews and one thing leads to another. And like in all of these finds, when you start, when you say you find the Templars in North America, I tell you, you take a lot of heat for this, <laughs> which I did. And I just kept, you know, moving along and kind of kept quiet. And I wasn't, you know, looking to do anything major with it at this point or at that time, because I just didn't feel the evidence was strong enough. And um, all of a sudden, somebody from Norway reached out to me and we started talking and we started sharing ideas. And Sean Williams, as he gave, became more and more into this, he started opening up and sharing more ideas. And so one day I asked him, Sean, I said, you know, I, we've been doing this now. I've been doing this. Uh, I'm a novice at this. You're uh, really skilled. Alexandra Natavari up in Nova Scotia, she was very helpful and, and, and gave me ideas and and information, and we work quite a bit together, uh, as well as Gretchen Cornwall. And I was able to work with uh, John Edwards and Jeff Freeman uh, for a short time. They they assisted me, and then they moved on to other things. But I I asked Sean. I says, "You take that round rock on it on on this structure. What if this is a tomb? What if it's initiation tomb?" I said. When you think about this in biblical terms, the Templars 
they actually lived in a small building off of Solomon's temple. That's where the, the term Knights Templar came into being from the information that I had learned. You have the round rock, right? Isn't that kind of reminiscent of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea representing Christ? Uh, the stone that was put in Christ's tomb. On the back wall, you got three carved crosses. Erosion hasn't been very kind in Wisconsin. We get terrible winters here in springs. It's extremely hot in the summer and, and you know, the, the rock and everything with water and a crystallization and fading. So you got the three crosses. Is that is that a representation of Golgotha? The three, the three uh, you know, Christ and the two thieves that were buried. Also, we found a faint carving of a sword inside of the tomb. And we photograph that. Does that kind of reminiscent in the Garden of Gethsemane when uh, one of Jesus' disciples cut off the priest, the high priest's ears, his, his uh, soldiers? Wow, things are just, what does one do with all this? Still, I'm not satisfied. As an investigator, I'm still not satisfied. How do the Templars get here? has to be the waterways, right? So you start looking at the waterways, and one has to understand that the, the ground structure, the forest cover in the, in the 13, 1400s was much different than it is today. Uh, the massive logging during the late 1800s, early 1800s, into the 1900s, massive pine trees. There wasn't all the ground cover that there was today. Some of these trees were four or five, six feet in diameter. So there, there was little to no undergrowth. And you could see probably, you know, a couple hundred yards and, tra and traversing it wouldn't have been much of a problem. But you only had a certain amount of times that you could go. So then I started doing some... Um, Star mapping. I had talked to Dave about this. I wanted to find out um, how the temple was possibly used navigation to get here. Well, I come across the document in London where they talked about the, a planet called Lamurca, and all the scholars and all the academics shot this down. But I was intrigued by this one little word, Lamurca. And so I started looking into it. Here the Phoenicians used it. Uh, the Hebrews knew about it. The Muslims, the Arabs, even the Chinese. Turns out to be it's Ursa Major, the Bear Star. Coincidence? So I started doing this star mapping. When I would go to these sites, I would do star mapping overhead and see what the constellations are, what significant events were happening. All of a sudden, these seven star patterns started showing up overhead. I'm not an astrologist. Dave, now he can go on for hours and talk about this, but I think he can understand the significance of having a seven star alignment over a certain area that's at certain different year intervals. And so I started tracking these intervals and wrote down the dates that these intervals would show up. And... Um, now this is all starting to get a little bit more heavy on the evidence side. The other thing I come across too, how were the, Nat how were the Native Americans that seen the Templars? Templars once and once the mightiest force in Europe, right? Um, they basically ruled most of Europe. They fought in all the major crusades and they were a mighty force to be reckoned with. But the, there's some some reports that they were also opportunists because they took the time to learn. Even from the Muslim people, they did trading with them. They studied their mathematics. They studied their shipbuilding, um, their alchemy and things like that. And, and they took a lot of that information back with them. They were probably one of the first major banking systems that, that spread across from Europe to Jerusalem. Things that... Other people a lot smarter than me that can talk about the Templars. But as I would talk to these learned people and academics from around the world, 
I say the key is everybody was missing one, one of the most important keys. They all stopped at 1392, Columbus. Well, there's a lot of money being made off of colleges and stuff teaching that type of history, right? No one wants to give up. That's a big box. If anybody, they all they knew the Norse is here, and they did some studies on it. They did some dates and talked about it a little bit. But to put other people here, boy, and all that kind of shoots down the academics and all of their credentials and all their teachings for years and years. What a touchy subject to be going head, head on into. And again, I would I would read all of these academic reports. And they missed one of the key ingredients is all times, the Native Americans. Why wasn't no one talking about the Native Americans? When Verzano went to North Carolina, there I found three major trade routes that the French, the Spanish, and the English were using to come to the New World. Um, I, um, I also found uh, evidence of possibilities that Irish were, could have been in North America in the early 900s. So, but it was interesting, all of these three trade routes, one of them went to North Carolina, one went to Nova Scotia, and one went up to the St. Lawrence River area. Well, it, it just so happened that the Welsh, um, Prince Maddox, landed off of North Carolina on an island. It was the same trip though. When, when Verzano got there, he went south and saw the Spanish fleet and turned around and went back north. And he ended up in Narragansett Bay. He was just, he wrote about how impressed that he was with the Narragansett people. Um, they were working with copper. They understood astrology. They were planting by, by astrology. They they were throwing him um, massive feasts, um, showing them such kindness. Uh, they were basically giving them everything they had. It was kind of a Native American custom that when you came across a stranger, you would give him gifts to show them that you were a, a kind people, a wealthy people, and that the material thing just wasn't all that important. It was the act of uh, uh, befriending a stranger, taking him into your house, making him feel welcome. And Verzano does one thing, which a lot of the early Europeans did. He sees gold laying in the rivers. And he asked the, the Narragansett people about this and says, well, what is this to you? Do you know what this is? And they said, no, we don't use that metal very much. We're more interested in copper and things like that wasn't too shortly after that, like most of um, the early explorers, Columbus being another one of them, they were capturing it, small Indian children, seven, eight, nine years old, and they were taking them aboard the ship. Zano tried to capture three of them, um, one little girl um, and another Indian boy and an older Indian girl, but she fought back so hard that she escaped, but he did escape with two of them. And what they were doing, they were taking these Native American kids back and teaching them their language. And then they would go back later on and use them for translators. So Rosano, he sees this gold. And, he, and one thing that most of the people didn't understand that the great communication system that the Native Americans have, they sent word up and down the East Coast that these people were coming. So he goes up to Nova Scotia and run into the Mi'kmaq tribe. But they wouldn't have nothing to do with them. Um, they actually would only trade with them off of cliffs. They would lower baskets and they would uh, throw things in baskets and pull them up. And it was kind of funny because Verzana wrote how crude they were because when they sailed away, they, uh, in today's terms, they mooned them. <laughs> they showed them their backside as a sign of disrespect <laughs> because they know they weren't honorable people. And from that time forward, anytime you've seen contact from the Europeans, Native Americans were ignorant people living in caves. They didn't know nothing. They were savage people. And all it was was a ruse to take their 
natural resources, the gold, the copper, the furs, the forest products that Europe didn't have at that time and was depleting itself on. So we have done massive trade investigations. Ken Kieser, he's our uh, archivist, and we have worked together for now for about seven months, putting together trade items to show um, a line of evidence who was coming here, when and where, where they, when and where they were going to and what was being taken back. Uh, the Kiwan Peninsula, one of the biggest copper finds in North America with um, 98%, 95 to 98% pure copper, the only place found in the world. Here's, here it was found off in the Phoenician ship off the coast of Greece with oxide ingots, over, over 100 of them. And when the archaeologists went to test them, they tested one, found it out it was 96% pure copper. And that's the only place that it comes from is the Cuban Peninsula in Michigan. Don't hear no more about that kind of stuff. So the Native Americans were were um, very well schooled in astronomy, agriculture. They had orchards. They had massive trading routes all the way from Nova Scotia down to New Mexico. They were trading obsidian, and copper, um, different types of potteries. They found Bermuda seashells up in Nova Scotia. Um, we come across the evidence in the Wisconsin archaeological dig where they found obsidian from the state of Wisconsin. How does that stuff just happen to show up? It shows that the Native Americans had established all of these trade routes within, uh, within their own country for years and years. The Inuit um, knew, of the, knew of the Vikings and they had skirmishes with them. When you go back to the Vikings and you think how when they arrived, they didn't fare too well with the Native American people. They stayed approximately maybe four years according to academic reports. And um, then they left. Well, they didn't leave. They were run off by Native Americans. Even I believe it was Eric Red. his son was killed with an arrow at a skirmish from shores when they saw him trying to land because they saw them as conquerors. They didn't see them as people wanting to come there to be friend. They saw that their, their land, their, their uh, precious stuff, their food supplies are gonna be taken and, and just basically squandered. Jumping back in time, you see the Knights Templar, one of the most powerful people in Europe, crusading across uh, Europe and to the Holy Lands, Jerusalem and things. And all of a sudden, um, now the Pope and the King of France, they're into them for a lot of money. So what do you do? You make them the terror of the town, the most evil people, so you don't have to pay them. 1307 in uh, New Rochelle, uh, but then in France, when um, the Templars fled, a lot of them fled to Scotland. And I can't go into the details of how we know who picked them up at this time because it's confidential uh, TTNA, which stands for Team Templar North America Information. But uh, we're sitting on a lot of information who went down there and who picked them up and fled. So it's a little bit of an overview, an expert, I'm not. But I hope this kind of gives you a general idea what we were looking for as we look deeper into this. And also the other big thing that we came across was the cross-culturalization between the Knights Templar and the Native Americans. You got the Templars now basically labeled as refugees fleeing from Europe. They went to some parts of Europe where they weren't harassed too much. Then they went to other parts like Scotland and some went down to probably uh, Chile. And when you, you read, a lot of people discount the Zeno brothers in their narrative. Fact, fiction, well, I'll leave it to people to debate. But we've come across information now where those stories might actually hold more water than what people want to believe. 
because if you discount the Zeno brothers, you discount world travel. You discount the discovery of the new world. And I've come across documents that Columbus was on a ship 10 years before he even discovered America and knew where America was. So he didn't discover America. That information has been hidden. We call it scrubbed from uh, books to, to just make a narrative so that it's easy for academics and people who want to sell that type of history. Then we started seeing Native Americans with um, cross pâtés tat tat tattooed on their bodies. Um, the four circles, which resented the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, which were all historic Templar symbolism. Why would they put that on their bodies if they didn't know this Templars and understand what type of people they were? Um, my personal belief is that the Native Americans saw the Templars as refugees seeking asylum. They came there, they didn't present themselves as conquerors. They came there as a spirit of friendship and wanting to assimilate. I was sent three massive volumes and um, I have to uphold the secrecy of the person that sent them. Are they real? I read a lot of stuff and I just kind of take it at face value. But some of the information and it is very interesting and we're looking into it, we're investigating it. Um, Ken Kieser, our archive, is where he has a database now with over probably 6,000 references of trade items and contacts. So we're building this, this massive database so that when we can start a possible TV series, it's gonna be one of the biggest that um, that's going to be out there. We picked up a film. Um, he's a producer and director, Alan Scott. He used to work with the BBC. He's also in Scotland. Just an amazing photographer. I'm sure, Dave, if you've been on Team Temple or later, you've seen some of his work. He's freelancing now. He just got tired of all the academics and filming discovery and things like that and how they would adjust the narrative to meet a certain outcome. And he was uh, really excited to join Team Templar. He says, I finally found a place where I could go and photograph the truth. And that's uh, what we're all about, you know? Are we 100% certain about all this? No, but I tell you, there's things that are warming up. We're, we're sitting on a lot of personal documentation of Andrew Sinclair documents from Rosalind Chapel, um, the five sites here in Wisconsin. I think it's quite a story that's just waiting to be told. And I'll stop rambling now. I'm not sure I say something. Yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal information, Wayne. You know, and of course, I fully support um, the entire mission. And I've done a fair amount of research myself in the United States. Uh, you know, of course, I go to ancient sites and I'll take measurements and take compass readings and bearings and energy readings. Um, and so I've seen a lot of these things firsthand in, as well. And it's awfully hard to explain uh, with, that, with the conventional ways that people are explaining it. Um, I, did a, I was doing some research up in uh, New England, actually, on my trip uh, over the past three months. And of course, there's a lot of stone walls in New England. And there's actually some smaller chambers, maybe two feet high entrance kind of tucked into the hillside and they are definitely aligned um, to different uh, solar events, you know, either solstice or equinox, sometimes both. Um, and, you know, some people try to say, okay, the colonists, they came over, they did this when they were pulling rocks out of the fields. Now it is true that there's lots of rocks in New England. Um, I grew up there obviously. So there's, there's plenty to build walls with and to build piles and things of that nature. But the point for me is, is that this is, it's not arbitrary placement. And it's very similar to when I see the first time I saw the picture of the tomb lane. I mean, you know, I said, yeah, that looks placed. It does look placed. It's not something that I would expect to see a, a glacier just deposit like that, you know, perfectly round <laughs> lint, lintel stone. You know, no, I, I don't think so. And 
the fact that it's facing east, which is highly symbolic, you know, according, of course, in astrology, it's the rebirth of the sun in the east um, around Easter time, the spring equinox. And then you've got the summer solstice um, sunrise line, which, which actually rises in the northeast as well. So these things, they're not random, especially when you put the, the world picture together, you see that there's all these connections um, that some people have been trying to make actually for quite a long time, but I, I think we're finally getting traction. I really do. Uh, Karen, mm -hmm. what, do you, what, what do you think about this, Karen? Oh, I agree. I think um, personally, my opinion is that all our mainstream history has been fabricated. And um, I also uh, think that the information out there, the mainstream information really gives people a false perception of, um, you know, of the Europeans and the colonizers and everything else and has done a huge disservice to the First Nations and Indian peoples of North America. Um, because um, from, the, from the research I've done, the First Nations, that's what we call uh, Indian people in Canada, and the, um, all the North American Indian peoples, they had a very well evolved society. They didn't have war the way the Europeans did. They had skirmishes and things, but they settled things. There was a there was a completely different way of being that, you know, the Europeans could have learned from. But instead, um, you know, they've created this false narrative. So I'm very happy, Wayne, that you're that you're on the show today and that you're sharing this information. Now I advanced the screen share to the next slide. I'm wondering if you already covered this information or uh, whether you'd like to talk a bit about it. Um, we dropped off for a second there. There we are, I'm back. Oh, good. Could you just repeat your last statement, Karen? Yeah, I was, I was uh, saying out of the slides that you sent, I advanced to the next slide and I'm wondering if you already covered this material or would you like to talk a little bit about it? Because it looks to me like a Templar cross carved right into the rock. Yeah, that's an interesting um, uh, stone formation I came across. I would just like to um, comment on your last statement about the Native Americans and your skirmishes and stuff like that. <clears throat> Most of that was over hunting ground and everything like that. So they didn't have these massive blood raids and things like that. Did they fight just like anybody else? But one thing that Verzano wrote, that the Six Nations... I don't know if a lot of uh, people understand this. The Six Nations had a form of government where they would meet every year and certain tribes had the power to veto or to vote for their governmental system. And they, they used to send three young men along from their tribes and they had to learn the, the tribal history orally and they had to repeat it perfectly before they could advance to the next level. You know, and that's found in a lot of cultures, the Jewish, the same thing, but it was the way of keeping their traditions alive. The Six Nations government and the way it was set up is the way that the constitution of this country was set up. And you're not gonna hear a lot of that talked about uh, <laughs> in school today. So just the, uh, just small bits of information how the Native American people have been been trained as standing on the shore waiting for Europeans to come by, begging for nuts and berries. And <laughs> none of that uh, never happened. Just a tad bit of more information about the Captain Kendrick Apollo. He wrote a letter to Jefferson when he was in office and he said, he actually fought with Washington in the Revolutionary War, which a lot of our people did. They were kind of led to believe you fight with us and we went up with the British, you can get your land back. This didn't work out too well for them. But he writes this letter to Jefferson and he says, we, our forefathers met you on the shores, what you call New York. He says, we saw you as small children, simply. We took you into our bosom and gave you land. So, for befriending the people, you know, you can tell, you can see what happened. 
Don't skip over this brief commercial break. Dave and I have some important information for you. You may have noticed that participation in our community does not depend on memberships or donations, and we do not hide our episodes behind a paywall. We want everyone to have the opportunity to learn and share our important content with others. Dave and I both offer services, which may make your journey more fulfilling, and I offer some products as well. Our sales and services are what provide us with the means to continue our work as there are many expenses associated with our mission. Check out our offerings to find that which resonates with you to help create a win-win situation. What I mean by that is financial support to help cover our expenses but also some great products and services to give you that edge that you've been looking for. Check out my online shop, www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com to find Zendome's Orgone Generators, Comfort Crystals, and an array of vital services, all designed to help you to become the change that you wish to see in the world. Now, more than ever, people are awakening to a world we never imagined possible. In response, Dave and I are offering tools, methods, and podcast content to assist you with your awakening process. You are not alone, and there is still much we can do to support our health, emotions, and our spirituality. We both combine ancient wisdoms with cutting-edge technology to help bring comfort to your body, happiness to your mind, and joy to your spirit. To assist you with your life journey, check out my website and find many valuable resources. There's the nine steps to quantum health transformation. This is a free, comprehensive online course. Learn about detoxification and nutrition, grounding and spiritual practices, and an advanced version of the Law of Attraction, giving you more of what you really want out of life. I also have my Zendome's Organite, which is my unique brand of organ generators. They're ethically sourced and handmade by a friend of mine, and they're double charged for maximum effect. I also carry Comfort Crystals, which is a limited collection of energetically infused semi-precious stones. I have an array of vital services, so you can get the one-on-one support that you've been looking for. Also coaching, guidance, and I do assessments and also workshops. And then again, there are the many free resources available on my website wisdom to assist with energetic ascension into physical, mental, and spiritual paradise. Also, check out Dave's services. Dave can teach you about astrology and spiritual concepts, principles of Eastern medicine, birth charts, relationship matching, spiritual guidance, fasting, and his unique approach to health. You can find Dave's services on his Facebook page, Instagram at Dave Petrella 12 and his YouTube channel. The links can be found in the description box below. Let us share our quantum work with you. It's your turn to heal, evolve, and thrive. Believe in your ability to succeed. Now, let's get back to the show. Okay. Um... These stone carvings, the reason I sent these, and when I came across this, you'll notice that there's, as you look at the top slide, you can see how it's squared off. And then if you look to the right, you see a large tree. Well, that tree could be probably by the size of it, I'm suggesting, I used to log, so I I kind of know a little bit about trees. I worked in the woods for quite a few years. That tree right there is a hemlock. It's 
could be possibly over 100 years old. So nothing has been moved from that for at least 100 years. And then as you look to the right, you can see uh, that tree, you can see a split. But just off to the right in front of that, you can see uh, the similar slab carving on another rock that's at an angle. This rock, if this is natural, right? How come the rocks aren't laying below the stones? Why isn't that slab just laying there? If this is broken up through frost, you know, and expansion and contraction through the harsh Wisconsin winters, wouldn't you find the big pile of slab rock laying at the bottom? And I looked all through this area. I can't find out where these slabs went. One of these slabs would come off, I would assume that they would weigh probably pretty close to 50 to 100 pounds. It's just not something you're going to be picking up and walking around. This is quite a large uh, find here. And we haven't, it's, it's really hard to metal detect around areas like this. And we're not going to say what we found or what we detected and what hits we got and things like that. Because we're very careful, we want this document. We want somebody standing there with, from the outside who has no uh, no dog in his fight to film this and say, "Hey, this is what we're doing. This is the actual time that they're metal detecting. This is the actual dig. This is the fire." Still with us, Wayne? Well, I hope he logs back in and logs out, logs back in again, because it's so interesting, the information. Oh, yeah. So in interesting. Phenomenal. Karen, you know what the, you know what else that looks like to me, too? It actually looks like a, a, a knight's helmet. You know, when they had the, the nose covering coming straight yes. down like that? Yes. So I and actually, I, I didn't even see, I see what you're saying now with the cross, but I, it could be many different things. Does yeah. not look natural. I'll say that. It, it's no, very no right, it's right not. Angle. It's not natural, uh -huh. and I'm also wondering if the um, uh, high Wayne good you're back. Um, Dave and I were just saying how um, we look at this image. Uh, I see a cross. Dave sees a helmet, and we were wondering if the copper tools that the um, that the original North Americans were using. Um, if they would be able to cut through stone like this, is that possible? No, not at all. When Sean Williams was examining these pictures, he's at a, um, you know, he's at a disadvantage. He can only examine them through very detailed close-up pictures and everything. But these were cut by hardened chisels that were forged hardened steel. And one thing when the Templars traveled, they took along blacksmiths with them. They took along clergy. They took people that understood healing and, you know, herbal medicines. They just didn't go wandering through the woods, you know, just aimlessly. They were ever, every trip that they took was on a mission. They, they went there for a specific reason. And Sean is a pretty firm belief that that Templar cave or templar tomb or and other scholars who have looked at this academics who have looked at it are like-minded like we are feels that this could have been a resurrection tomb and the one of the things that the that the templars did as in a resurrection tomb and i had several other people after I explained to them the, the round stone the Golgotha the three crosses they were just like floored they said, oh, my God, it's just all of us coming to sense. Um, a young knight who wanted to be a, a Templar knight, take his vows, he would go in there at sundown, lay down there for three days, rise up in the morning, and then take his vows. And it was symbolic of Christ going into the tomb at night and then rising again after the third day. Factual. I don't know, but when you put the totality of all of these things coming together and on this structure that you're looking at now, when I did the detailed photos of all the sides of these rocks, 
we think we might have found a floor plan of a building that's reminiscent in Jerusalem. Sean was just, well, the same as I was. I was just blown away. And then other people uh, that are privileged to information that we share with, they just couldn't believe it also. So there's some more carvings on this rock that you can see. And, and you guys are pretty observant in what you saw so far. Yeah, it's just excellent. Really, really excellent. It's really compelling. Uh, right, Karen? Oh, absolutely. And I, I love the fact that you're talking about it, Wayne, from your Aboriginal background in history, because it's so important. As you mentioned earlier, it's been distorted and eliminated. And this is part of how we find out what's going on is by taking a look at truth from different perspectives. So I'm very, very happy that you're sharing these images and, and explanations and stories with us today. It's important to get it out. Well, it's a real honor to be here. And one of the things that I discussed with the team is that it's, it's important for me to tell the truth about our people and Native Americans. They're, they, they were portrayed so badly, all in the name of greed. And I came across an old French Jesuit um, book, if you want to say, it was written in the early 1500s, and it was the last interview of a Mi'kmaq shaman. And when I come across this, I, I read this in great detail, and he was telling them stories how life was before the Europeans got there. And I said, it was, it was no trick for us to go out and get food. He says, sometimes we didn't even take bow and arrow. He said, we could go out with a stick, he says, and, and, and kill a rabbit or, or kill small game and fish were plentiful. The Europeans and their accounts, when they got there, they saw so many fish, they couldn't believe it. And it was just, you know, obviously it was just over harvested. And then the, the Jesuit asked him, he says, how come your people don't plant corn no more? And a lot of people said that Native Americans didn't have corn. Well, it's kind of odd why corn shows up in Roslyn Chapel. You know, Sir Henry Sinclair and his voyages, uh, where was he getting these images from? You know, um, there's, um, he had a great respect for the Mi'kmaq people and that culture and that way of life. And I, I was able to talk to um, a, a young lady uh, from a Templar uh, preceptory and, and we started sharing ideas. And one of the stones that was carved in Roslyn Chapel, everybody thought it was a low, you know, cactus plant. So I have this app on my phone where I, when I looking for different herbal stuff, um, I take pictures of them and it gives me an idea what it is. No, I'm not thinking that was going to mean much. I, I downloaded the picture from Roslyn Chapel, which is supposedly the, a low cactus plant. It came up, it wasn't a low, it said it was a fern. Well, that's very interesting. So I did some research on that fern, and I said that fern was an invasive species in Denmark. Hmm. Well, how did this invasive species that came from Canada end up in Denmark? Still, I wasn't satisfied yet. So as I looked deeper into this, because I, I, I was able to put a lot of the Native American tattoos tied to the Knights Templar, I was starting now, we had put extensive trade items in America to the Knights Templar, into Europe. You couldn't believe the items that we found and can, can tie back into Europe in the 1100s in, in 900s that are in museums right now. And they want to tell you where they come from. Yes, excellent picture. If you, this, this is a Mig Mag, this is drawn by a, a, a French man. I, I think it was in the 1700s. If, if you look at the tattoos on his bodies, you, you, you've got, you know, an anchor. You've got the different symbolics as above, as below. All Knights Templar in origin. And so at Team Temple in North America, we just don't look at one thing. We think of this leg as a diamond. A diamond has many facets. We want more than just pictures that somebody drew. Great symbolism in this picture 
fantastic. Um, you could spend probably two shows talking about the symbology of different cultures of the, the tattoos drawn. Oh dear, I think we got a bad connection. I hope it comes back soon because I really want to hear what Wayne's saying. Oh yeah, it's just, it's just amazing information. I mean, I'm so excited. I, I really truly hope that the show gets off the ground, Karen, you know, and I think people would love to see this. Uh, an accurate, you know, uh, no nonsense, uh, let's say non-Hollywood. Uh, let's just get, get the information out there. I want to see real conversations with real people. And we don't need we don't need the nonsense, you know. We don't need the frill. I just want to see what's going on, and I believe for a very, very, very long time that there's a lot of hidden history on the, well, the whole world. But since I'm uh, you know living uh, United States on this continent in particular, and I've seen so much of it with my own eyes, you know, mm -hmm. all, even all of the all of the mound builder civilization. Um, I think you and I have talked about that before on your show, Karen. Yeah. that's another aspect it's like okay you know who did this and then you have the stone structures in new england who did that so there's all these questions and um i think i think we're smart enough to figure it out we just need to uh what i believe maybe try to form our own um our own groups and our own media outlets and things like that and the people who want good information you know they're going to start coming to where the good information is if, if mm -hmm. they're not being, if they're not happy with, with what's on uh, cable TV, then, okay, come over to a, a different network. You know, we'll tell you good information and there's not going to be any, any, any hype or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's also really lovely to see um, Native uh, American people um, telling the story from their perspective. And the other thing, Dave, is I think a lot of the problems we're having in this world could be cured by going to the Aboriginal peoples and finding out how things really were for them before being conquered and um, imperialized. So I think there's great value in looking to um, native indigenous groups from all around the world, which interestingly, they have similar ways of doing things that are peaceful and um, peaceful and uh, economies that work and survive. There's so much for us from European descent to learn from the Aboriginal peoples. So I'm very encouraged and very happy that Wayne's on the show today. I'm thinking he might be having some technical difficulties. I do hope he comes back. Mm -hmm. But if he uh, is not able to come back, um, we'll have to have him on and to do another show. What do you say about that, Dave? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is, you know, this is a developing story. I can't wait to see. Uh, of course, every month there's new information. Uh, Wayne does have a Facebook group called Team Templar North America, uh, TTNA for short. It's on uh, Facebook. So if people want to go ahead and join that, you can um, follow and keep up with, you know, the latest updates and the progress at the sites in Wisconsin and everything and some new information coming out. It's a really great group. I joined it probably mm -hmm. about a year ago. So, uh, and I like to see, you know, I like to see everything that's going on and um, I try to stitch and patch things back together and, and see if we can, uh, if we're making progress kind of, uh, and I just fully support anyone who's after this kind of information, you know, let's just tell it how it is, how you see it, let's get the information out there, let's get the good data out there, and then let's draw informed conclusions because mm -hmm. uh, we have we have so much at our fingertips we just need to get it I believe in front of people and we need to do it in a way that's uh, scientifically sound I would say which which Wayne had mentioned that Karen in terms of he wants to make sure that there's someone who's documenting everything uh, doesn't have uh, a dog in the game I believe is the phrase he used which you know essentially means like you want someone that's neutral or you want someone that's unbiased coming in because they're not trying to cover something you know, like preserve the mainstream history or whatever. It's just like, okay, we found this. This is really interesting. You know, maybe we can't explain it, but that doesn't matter because it, the fact is, is you have the information in front of you. So we need to start, we need to start not ignoring it and we need to start getting it in front of people. Uh, we have such a lost history on this world. There's just so much out there. Um, 
that needs to be told correctly and we need to continue digging deep i feel uh and, yeah, I do, I do and, know, and the wisdom can. and the wisdom that comes from that as well yeah absolutely the wisdom is of course key um and what i study of course you know the wisdom out of ancient india is what i believe is the finest wisdom on this planet uh and even their their ancient history it goes back millions if not more of years their time cycle karen we we did a, a show on this in the past on quantum guide show uh mm -hmm. 4.32 million years long for one cycle and that would also be the explanation for for me for why the hindus have 33 million gods because their history is millions and millions of years old. Um, and, you know, it, it's not surprising to me that they have the best preserved wisdom. And even still, a lot of that wisdom has been lost. I've been, you know, the past 15 years, I've just, I've just been trying to get things together again so we can see it on the same table. And let's like look at the different pieces and then let's see how it fits. And not, it's not what I want it to be. It's actually never that way. I gave that up before I started doing science. I probably gave that up when I was like 10 years old, Karen. It's like, let's, I go in unbiased. Let's look at the data. You know, I'm not trying to promote one thing or another. I just want to know what happened, you know, for goodness mm -hmm. sake. Is, is that too much to ask? It's ridiculous. Some, it feels like you're, you're pulling teeth some days just to get good information in front of people. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to add Wait. one more thing. Oh, oh good, sorry. Karen. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Well, I want to add one more thing about the tomb, and uh, I do believe I've shared this with Wayne in the past, but, you know, it's kind of my, my initial feeling when I see that. Um, I get, uh, obviously, I'm a scientist, but I, I do have a, a fairly um, focused intuition as well. So when I see something and I get a feeling about it, you know, I, again, I keep that as information. I'm not saying that's what it is, but I keep that right next to all the other pieces of information I have. But when I saw that, what it felt like to me was a megalithic stone structure. Um, I believe it is reminiscent of the Stone Age. And um, when I look at the Stone Age, again, I'm looking at a world history. And I have a lot of information, huge amount, a lot of firsthand information, too, that supports that. Um, I actually did a little bit of research in Wisconsin, not, not um, very close to Wayne's site, but really not too far away. There's just huge rocks up on the mountains. You have, they're piled on the, it's called uh, Devil's Lake State Park. They're just kind of piled on the ridge there. Uh, Aurora knows about this too. We can actually talk about this with Aurora when she comes on the show too. And she grew up in that area, Karen. And it looks like a profile of some kind of a, you know, a, a native person or some kind of a giant perhaps, or some kind of a god or something but it's literally perched right on the edge. This is a very precarious, it's actually quite dangerous area. It's like, and it's like if it moved at one centimeter, that rock would be over the edge. How do you get that? A glacier does not, a glacier does not deposit something that looks exactly like a human face from more than one side, by the way. It's not just the one side of the profile. It's like, I looked at it from at least three different angles and I saw at least two different faces. So, that is, you're telling me that that's perched on the edge like that. It looks like it's been worked. Again, it's, you know, similar idea that the stone looks like it's been worked and it's balanced with, you know, not in a centimeter for error. You know, I don't think that, I don't think that's a glacier. Now, maybe it was directed by a glacier and then, you know, helped along by someone else. But what I wanted to say, and I think Wayne's trying to connect back here. And so hopefully we can get him back for a few more minutes here. Yeah, he's um, back now. Oh, great. Okay. Welcome back, Wayne. Oh, it's good to be back. <laughs> yeah. Modern technology. Oh, yeah. definitely. So when I was sharing with Karen about um, Devil's Rock State Park, you know, I did a little bit of research when I was in mm -hmm. Wisconsin this summer. And, uh, you know, the, you got a stone up there. It looks like the profile of some kind of a person or a, a giant or a god. It's perched right on the edge of the cliff. I mean, it's like a thousand feet down probably. And, you know, how does that happen? Is that a glacier? Is, does someone work that? Um, I was I was wondering if you could mention um, the giant topic because it's a big topic for me, and I know that there's some legends about that topic with uh, your people. Yeah, um, when when you start talking about the Nephilim and and, and things that I I've, I've discussed this um, with various people from around the world, um, the Nephilim are are mentioned in the Old Testament, fallen angels. And 
everybody has a set opinion or no opinion or our various opinions. And as I started looking into this, I, I'm keeping an open mind, but I was talking to it with another tribal member and we were, we were discussing the Nephilim and giants. There is a legend amongst the Native American people where the Nephilim were probably along the southern edge of Wisconsin and Illinois, northern edge of Illinois by the Mississippi River. Two different tribes tried to come across down from Minnesota. They, they didn't, um, when they got to Wisconsin, they didn't want to, uh, um, the Nephilim that they met were, were just horrible people. They were cannibalistic. Um, they were, they were taking native women. They were, you know, killing the men and killing the children. And so when they got to the Mississippi river, they were able to communicate how, I don't know, maybe they spoke some of languages or through interpretation or, or sign language. They had come, they, the native Americans said, we'd like to cross. We'd wanted to go further East. <clears throat> And uh, because the, the growing seasons in Minnesota weren't very conductive to their crops. And the Nephilim said, no, you can't come across. You can't come into Wisconsin or across the Mississippi. So some time went on and, and finally the Nephilim agreed to let them cross. The Nephilim saw them coming across in numbers so great that a massive war started a massive fight started. Well, the Native Americans fought them and fought them to such extent that they ran them out and they ran them, ran them according to legends, they ran them down the Mississippi where other, other tribes pushed them further west. Interesting legend in all of itself. So I start looking into this a little further and I believe it was about the year 2000 there was some archaeologists out in West. Um, I'm not sure the state uh, could have been Arizona, New Mexico. And one of the Indian legends says that they chased the Nephilim into this large cave. And then they yeah. would try to taunt, they try to taunt them to come out to fight and they wouldn't. So what they did is they, they in the entrance of this cave, they piled masses amount of brush, probably mesquite and dead limbs and you know dead fallen trees and lit it on fire. Well, naturally that would suck the air out of the cave and they, they hoped that would draw the Nephilim out so they could finish them once and for all because they were described as such barbaric people. Didn't happen, they said the cave collapsed and um, that was the end of it. Well, these archeologists and scientists started digging around and inside this cave, a small entrance of what they could figure out was an entrance to a cave. They found extremely high temperatures where the rock had been burned <laughs> by massive amounts of wood. So in all legends, there is always some, some sort of truth. And the Mormons, the LDS church writes great accounts upon the Nephilim. And about, I had shared some of this with Dave, where they had found these massive burial pits um, in the east, uh, western edge of New York, going down into Ohio. And some of the femurs were four or five feet long. And just massive amount of graves uh, of giants, Nephilim, however you want to call them. And that supposedly wars that they had fought with the Native Americans and the Native Americans uh, uh, basically uh, run them into extinctions. And through further reading in these, um, I don't know if I shared this with you, Dave, um, they were um, down in, I believe it was Kentucky, or maybe even, well, we'll say Kentucky, that when the archaeologists were, were interviewing the, the Native Americans on the mounds, and they says, well, why did you build these mounds? They said, we didn't build these. These, these were here before us. These were built by white people. So 
when the Native Americans were run off their lands, farmers were going through these mounds with their plows trying to make the land more conducive to farming. They actually found some coinage that went back to the 1100s and they actually found a sword. You won't hear nothing about that. And different objects, they actually found metal that had been tempered and cast. Things that the Native Americans weren't doing at that time, you know, working with, you know, smelting metal. Yep. And so you start doing the totality of all of this stuff. And man, it just makes you wonder how come academia, academia just wants to mislead so much. So then I looked down further south when you get into the Aztecs down in Central America. They had, they were smelting, they were smelting gold and they were smelting copper long before they were in Europe or even in Asia. So they were building pyramids, my God, you know, they were, they understood great building techniques. Um, some, some early explorers uh, wrote about the massive cities that the Native Americans had and, and the massive building structures. Uh, Jumping a little bit back to the, the mounds that they found along the Ohio Valley and down into Kentucky. And they found old signs of um, forts where they uh, were, were um, I'm trying to help me, David, I'm trying to think of the word that they use for they put around forts. There's a term uh, for that. Palisades. They, oh, yeah, yeah, the wooden, the wooden, um trees basically right that they put up there with the spikes yeah. on the end yeah and then they yeah. also found moats and these moats were able to be flooded by water and the native americans they, they asked the eldest some of these native americans this is we, we don't we didn't work with that kind of material it wasn't us who built it and it was completely disregarded yep. so we at team templar we we look at a lot of things um because I, I find out if, if you don't look at a lot of things you're about to, you, you could miss one nugget of truth. I That's talk right. to a lot of people. Um, some people, their stories are, let's say they're a little eccentric and that's fine. I, I respect them. I listen to them. I give them time because even though their story may be a little eccentric, doggone, every once in a while they open my eyes and they just have that one kernel of truth which leads us to look at things differently. So we're, we're, we're not laser focused. Again, we look at this whole thing like a diamond. We're, we're looking at the actual physical evidence, things carved in granite, the, the tomb, the structures, the, the rock slabbing that you can see on these large rocks, the, the crosses, um, the symbolism, east entrance pointing towards Jerusalem, the rising sun, the north entrance pointing north in the hole on top of the tomb. Um, I don't know how much evidence, um, I don't know what that looked like five, seven hundred years ago. Is that set up with the sun and the west for the souls? You know, that's knowledge that I don't, I don't have. And I'll let smarter people like Dave and, you know, come to that conclusion. But I would say that Team Templar is probably the only group in North America right now with the evidence to show that there was massive travel and interaction with Native Americans and most likely it's that the Templars were here interacting with Native Americans. We have records from Rosalind Chapel. We have the research of Andrew Sinclair. I, I've talked to people from Templar preceptories and who are their archivists and they were just amazed oh I was commenting before we lost connection about the flowers carved in Rosalind Chapel about the Lowell so I, I did another quick analogy of that with a, um, a, an app I used to identify plants for herbs and for healing and stuff I come across the one flower that's located on Cape Britain, and it's a rose. This is very important. Dave, you understand that, and I'm sure you do also, Karen. And I said, you know, there's only one way 
we're looking at this wrong, that they're looking at a two-dimensional object, Carbon, Roslyn, and Chapel. How would you get that rose back to Scotland? We'd press it between vellum, right? So oh, now, yeah. when the artisans now when the artisans got there, they're looking at a two-dimensional subjects. So what do they carve? They carve what they see. And when I I sent the actual picture of the rose, its botanical name, its genus, and back to. Uh, <laughs> I don't think she wants me to mention her name. She was just like, Wayne, you hit a gold mine. I can't believe this. This would make sense because it was Cape Britain. And when I had talked to one of my contacts, Mig Mag, they come out and said the Templars never went to Oak Island. They went to Cape Britain. And, that's, and then they wouldn't say no more. I could not get no information at this time. One Wayne, of the Wayne. things that, go ahead, Dave. Is that is that the same as the trillium, or is this a different flower we're talking about? That's a different flower. Okay. See, other scholars have reached out to me and said, we believe that's a trillium. And that's very well possible. There could be uh, a trilliums carved in Roslyn Chapel. But the significance of the rose would have made sense because the rose is actually the Virgin Mary, a symbol for the Virgin Mary. What a better flower to carve inside Roslyn Chapel and bring back from a country to show you were there. You did, the, temp, the Roslyn Chapel was carved with so many symbolic symbols that all pertain to certain religious um, objects and artifacts that why choose only a rose? Again, it, it was symbolic. The rose is symbolic of the Virgin Mary. Yeah, excellent. Excellent information. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I just, oh, Karen, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go, before you go ahead, Dave, I just want to say that we're quickly running out of time. I don't want to cut either one of you off. So um, please do feel free to um, make some conclusions or some last minute things, tell people where they can find you, Wayne. We will have a link to your Facebook group in the description below, but go ahead, Dave, what were you gonna say? Well, I just wanted to add two final things quickly. Um, the first one is actually, Wayne, I wanted to tell you that I think you're referring to Lovelock Cave in Nevada. And I actually went there on this trip. And that's the story is that the giants were essentially burned out of the cave. And sure enough, when you go up, it's, it's actually a very easy hike, right? but it takes a long time to get out there. It's all dirt road. And my car was definitely not the best car to take out there. I should have I had like a Jeep or something. That's really the way to do it. But in any case, I went up there. And um, in terms of energetically, you know, actually, I, I did not feel anything strange, which I was kind of surprised about. It felt pretty peaceful, actually. And um, there is, in fact, a lot of tar you know and soot on the ceiling and it's quite thick it is quite thick it's a very large cave um and they've got kind of a little wooden platform in there so you can you know destroy any of the um artifacts or anything that's in the cave but it's something that it really makes you think um at the very least it was used for a very long time to keep warm in the nevada winters i would say but you know, the story, if, if, if a story keeps coming back and it might be a little strange to some people or seem a little mystical, that's not a reason to discount it. You know, what I do is I just put it in the back on the back burner and I keep it there for until I need it again. Um, mm -hmm. But it was uh, it was not a not a foreboding place. And like I said, I was kind of surprised about that based on what some of the history was uh, of that area. And the other thing, last thing I wanted to mention, too, is um and I think I, I had sent some of this to you before, Wayne, was uh, that so, what I believe really happened uh, in this world or the prehistory of what we have today is that there was a, uh, and I, I think Sean Williamson might agree with me on this. I heard him on an interview that you were on with him, Wayne, um, a few months back. I think it might have been last year sometime. But I think that there was a very large Neolithic culture, what you call it a Stone Age culture across the earth. It was a vast civilization, you know, roughly in the northern latitudes. They're kind of roughly the same latitude where you find a lot of these rock features. A lot of it has to do, I think, with that. That's the natural surrounding. So you take the rock and you, you build a structure with it, you know, and you carve into it and everything. But I found uh, some really interesting things. Of course, 
you know, if you it, let's start at Wisconsin just for a second here. If you start at Wisconsin, you start going east. There's a lot of really interesting rock structures um, throughout all throughout New England. I've done research in four or five different states. I found very strange, peculiar things that are very out of place. Um, some of the stone walls have alignments that are not, they're not alignments that you just dig a rock up if you're a farmer and just stack on a wall. If, if you see the same alignment, this is what I found, by the way, the same alignment on some of the walls across four different states in New England. That is a coordinated effort. It was either a civilization, I mean, probably was a civilization, a rock, um, rock culture civilization, or maybe something even more mystical. But anyway, as you continue east, then you go through, of course, UK, you have Stonehenge, um, you have the Karnak Stones in France, roughly, by the way, roughly all about the same latitude. You've got lots of standing stones all the way down into West Africa, all the way um, on the Atlantic coast there, all the way up through Ireland and everything. And then as you go east, one of the most interesting things that I found was actually that the Ural Mountains in Russia have some of these tomb-like structures they're very large. Uh, I believe it's like kind of on the east side of the Ural Mountains, uh, pretty far south. If people want to look it up, I can't remember the name. I could find it pretty easily, but it's a similar thing. It's like you've got these caverns and these tombs, and it does look like it's aligned. It's associated with a, a water body. You know, they place these things very specifically. And then if you go a little one step further, you've got um, actually uh, South Korea. You have these huge like dolmen structures. And again, it looks like, you know, for, to me, it looks like a large, um, a large body would, would have occupied it, whether it was a tomb or some kind of a chamber or meeting place or something. And then, of course, you've also got the dolmens in Ireland and throughout UK and everything. And you've got all these mysteries on, in the Mediterranean. Um, you've got Sardinia, the, the giant's tombs. And, I mean, people talk about this was the island of the giants, that they built the Naragi and all this stuff. It's not just one person. It's like this has been a tradition that's carried through. So I think when we look at the full picture, I think that we really start to put stuff together. And I do believe it was part of a large Stone Age culture. And then what I think happened was that uh, Vikings, Templar, or potentially other groups of people as well, Phoenicians possibly, came in and repurposed some of these structures that they found there. But I personally think that they were, and I know this sounds far out there to some people, um, but you know I do try to look at it scientifically as possible. And you just wonder how on earth would someone, you know, a, a human, a six foot tall human, put something like this in place and, and align it perfectly? How do you move such large stones, you know? So that's that's kind of the big point um, that I want to make at the end there. But Wayne, I really appreciate you coming. I mean, this was just phenomenal. Uh, I think Karen feels the same way. Thank yeah, you so we'll have much. to have you back. Maybe we could do a whole show just on giants because I'm very passionate about the about giants and uh, the history of giants. And I've actually had a, a spiritual vision regarding the returning of giants one day. So I think we should do a show on that. But Wayne, Very um, interesting. What, what would you like to say to the viewers today? It's been indeed a pleasure to have you on the show. Love to have you back. Um, like I said, we'll have your Facebook group in the in the description below. But what what are your final words to our our if not final forever but for now <laughs> your um well, and, well, your I hope not and, and contact <laughs> anything you want people to yeah. know about you Wayne um I really appreciate Karen and Dave having it's a it's an honor to be on your show and just a couple of things so that people understand to the depths of that what Team Templar goes to. Um, we also look at cymat, um, cymatics, the, mm -hmm. the sound that stone structures give off. We look at things like that. Um, we're hoping to get somebody maybe that can do photogrammetry for us to put inside of the tomb to get a better idea of what all was carved into that. Uh, through photogrammetry, you're able to re uh, retrieve those carvings that time and erosion has um, dissipated. So we, we look at a wide variety of things and I'm so grateful for, for, for you, Karen and Dave and all your listeners for allowing me the chance to tell the story of the Native American people, a great history, a great people, and to touch upon world travel that people just doesn't think happened. And 
talk a little bit about the Knights Templar. And there's a lot more people well versed. But again, it was it was an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, Dave and I will be back in a couple of weeks with um, episode six of the Aliens and Astrology show. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Please do like this video, share it with your friends. Let's help get this information out there. And we'll see you back here again real soon. Bye-bye for now. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you, Wayne. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for joining Dave and I for the Aliens and Astrology Show. Become the change you want to see in the world. Subscribe to our YouTube channels, click the like button, and share this show with your friends. Check out Karen's website at karenholdenhealthcoach.com. All the links will be in the description box below. Until the next time, keep up the good work. Challenge my perception I shift uneasily As I try to justify How I value your suggestions Ideas full of life When I'm empty of my own And five minutes before I was okay Now the curtain drops to the floor Leaves me weak and begging for more When I think I get it Vanish away.